What do you say we get some people in America and we get some plants in the ground on purpose? So this is the second section of the lecture for module one. We're going to get some people in America, as I said, and get some plants in the ground on purpose, by which I mean agriculture. The Americas were the last place, a uh, major place, to be populated by humanity. The last, last place is New Zealand, actually. But the last major, let's say, continent that's going to contain humans in our story this semester is the Americas. The earliest confirmed date of human presence in the Americas is 12,000 BCE, uh, some, some 40,000 years after humans uh, had already populated Eurasia as well as Australia. So it's a pretty long time until humans make it into the Americas. Homo sapiens were the only type of hominin to make it to the Americas. So there's no Neanderthal, there's no, I don't know, Australopithecus. There's nothing like that there. It's just Homo sapiens sapiens and no other hominin competition. Humans probably came to the Americas through this landmass you see on your map in the yellow. If I can uh, point it out here, it's just right here. Humans probably came to America by walking across what is called Beringia, a land bridge. Now, Beringia is currently covered by about 50 miles of shallow sea. At the time, however, it would have been open. Beringia was 600 miles north to south, that yellow bit on your map there, that exposed land. Much of North America was covered by ice at the time, about 10,000 feet thick. Scientists uh, believe that maybe there was an ice-free corridor across Canada. It's possible that uh, humans walked their way down from Alaska into what is now the territory of the United States. Um, that's one option. The other option is that once you get to Alaska, you hit the massive glaciers that are covering all of Canada with no corridor, and instead you travel by boat along the coast until you get to a place where there's no more glacier. If it was by boat, those boats are long gone. If it was by corridor, the glaciers creating it are long gone. We do not know how humans got from what is now Alaska to what is now the continental United States. What we do know, however, is that they very quickly made it down into what's going to become South America. And a major, major site for the very earliest humans is Monteverde, Chile. Going to have to forgive me, I do not speak Spanish either. So at this site, we get some evidence for the earliest human occupations in the Americas. It contains very early human remains, along with organic materials that almost never survive in any other context. Thanks to carbon-14 dating and stratigraphy at this site, we're able to establish the presence of humans as early as 12,000 BCE. Now, stratigraphy is fairly easy to explain. Stratigraphy is simply the idea that things lower in the dirt are older than things higher up in the dirt, because over time, dirt comes in and buries this and leaves this exposed until it comes in and buries this and so on and so forth. So the lower layer of tools uh, suggests settlement that may date as early as 31,000 BCE, but there's no other evidence of human occupation at that level, just the tools. All of our burns from campfires, our human remains, those are somewhat more recent on an archaeological scale. The tools they found, stone and wood, implements, spears, uh, round tools for slings and bolos, and... What for a long time I somewhat embarrassing, embarrassingly pronounced atlatls. In fact, it's pronounced atlatls. A uh, kind of weapon that we'll look at in just a second. Uh, the people living here at this site, they would have hunted mastodon. They would have gathered shellfish, so they would have been living off the land. They would have been living 
off the sea. They're not quite at an agricultural state yet, and agriculture comes to the Americas pretty late. Not the latest, but pretty late. Um, but they would have been living a pretty standard hunter-gatherer lifestyle. I said we'd get to the atlatl, and here it is. If you can see what this human here, and I will use my cursor to try to help you, you see there is a bit of a piece of wood here in this guy's hand, in addition to this spear. Here is that piece of wood, there at the end of the spear, and there he keeps holding it, but the spear, whoosh, is gone. Uh, the atlatl had, uh, had two parts, so both this together is the atlatl. A long handle with a cup or a hook at the end, and a spear tipped with a sharp stone point. What it essentially does is add one more length, one more joint to your arm, which vastly increases your throwing power. It became, without this, uh, there'd be no way to take down Mastodon. This increases not just the distance, not just your accuracy, but the actual power of behind the spear gets increased through this device. Now, by 11,000 BCE, humans had fully settled the Americas and were using weapons called microblades, which they attached to wooden shafts. Like the people at Monteverde, humans elsewhere in the Americas combined hunting with gathering of wild fruits and seeds. Most groups in North America lived in the Great Plains, in what is called the Clovis Technological Complex, named after a site in Clovis, New Mexico. It's unknown exactly how large individual groups in the Clovis Technological Complex would have gotten, but there's evidence that points to something, some places being as big as about 60 people per group. That's a fairly standard number for this point in human history. At the end of what's called the Wisconsin Ice Age, the world quickly warmed. Rising sea levels ended migration to the Americas, cutting people off, and by 7000 BCE, Beringia was back underwater again. The ancestors of Amerindians spread out across the Americas, and they remained in isolation until 1492, which means the next time we come back to talk about these people, and they will have their own module, we will get through the Maya, and we'll talk about Cahokia and things like that, but we are not going to get in this class to the point where Europe makes contact. From right now until the end of the semester, they are on their own, cut off from the rest of the world. Let's then talk about the one major breakthrough in the prehistorical record of perhaps most importance. And that breakthrough is agriculture. Agriculture began through a process of cultivation and domestication. When we, when we see agriculture generally, we're going to want to see two things happening at the same time. We're going to want to see the purposive and regular cultivation of particular types of plants, and we're going to want to see alongside that the domestication of particular types of animals to be used as tools in farming. So there are some in-between steps. Horticulturalists, for example, garden, but do not have domesticated animals. Pastoralists, the other end of this, might follow around herds of animals that they have more or less domesticated and are grazing from place to place as nomads, but uh, do not themselves develop the sort of uh, cultivation, domestication of plants, and therefore do not develop agriculture. There are nine places around the world where agriculture arose independently. First, in West Asia, as we'll talk about in just a second. By 8,000, it's in the Yangtze River Valley in China. That same date, roughly, it's in East African Highlands. 7,000 BCE, the Indus River Valley in Pakistan. 5,000 BCE, it's made it to Southeast Asia. That same date, roughly, it's in New Guinea, it's in central Mexico. 4,000 BCE, the Peruvian, Peruvian Andes. And by 3,000 BCE, Sub-Saharan Africa also becomes an agricultural society. Everyone's growing different things, but everyone's learning to grow and cultivate plants more or less on their own. Who got it kicked off? Well, 
The group of folks that got it kicked off first are a group of people called the Natufiates. These are the first people that we know of to plant seeds, domesticate animals, and cultivate crops. I recently heard and this will contradict what I'm about to say, that the oldest cultivated crop, at least cultivated by humans, are almonds. If that's the case, we might need to uh, correct what your textbook has to say. Your textbook claims that it is, in fact, figs. So the Natufians live in this region here. You can see the green there of Mesopotamia. And Natufians began cultivating their first crop around 9400, 9400 BCE, again, figs. We know this because the figs that they ate did not contain seeds. So this means that they've been going along selecting uh, strains and selecting strains until they were able to make one that produced a seedless fig. And if they're not replanting seedless figs, who's doing it? Hold on, you say. How is it that they are able to keep moving on with these figs that are that aren't producing seeds if they're not producing seeds how's the plant reproducing at all well it has to do with how easy it is to grow figs with figs you don't have to start from seeds it's fairly easy to just transplant a cutting so you cut a little bit of a branch off stick that bad boy in the ground water it wait a bit you've got yourself a brand new fig tree and this is what the natufians were doing the next crop that the Natufians cultivated was grain. Natufians gathered grain at first, but eventually selected grains uh, based on essentially the strength of the stem. So they would select for and replant grains that had stronger stems so they could hold up against winds, and that had thinner husks around the seeds so that it was easier to remove the husk and easier to eat the grain inside. Agriculture made it possible to sustain a larger group population, and so while we once saw, say, 60 people per group being fairly normal in the Americas, Natufian houses begin to grow as Natufian villages begin to grow when the population starts to take off. Natufian houses were 10 to 20 feet across. They would have been dug halfway into the ground, halfway above the ground. They had a fireplace along one wall for cooking and things like that. And in this new and exciting world of agriculture, Natufian groups had gone from, again, our sort of 60 or so as the norm, to 150 to 250 people in just one group. They domesticate dogs sometime after the year 30,000 and continue to go on to domesticate goats, sheep, and cattle as farming tools and there we go we have our cultivated plants we have our domesticated animals as tools we have full blown agriculture the largest natufian settlement was jericho this would have existed sometime between 8300 and 7500 bce it would have had perhaps given the archaeological evidence about a thousand people living on about 10 acres of land. They would have planted barley, they planted wheat, maybe some figs and lentils. They collected evaporating salt from the Dead Sea. And the settlement was protected by a ditch and an eight-foot wall just behind that ditch. So they, ha they have neighbors that they're worried about, if nothing else, taking their stuff. There was also a watchtower about 20 feet tall inside the wall. This indicates a couple things for us. This indicates that the Natufians, this early, once you have cultivation of plants, once you have domestication of animals, meaning agriculture, you're getting a city plan together, and you're getting probably someone at the center of that city who is able to, for one reason or another, control the excess crops produced in that city and use that control, perhaps not very strong, but control nonetheless, use that control to plan and realize pretty significant for its time public works projects. The ditch, the wall, the tower. So this means we've got a ruler there mobilizing labor. We've got some kind of at least loosely classed society already emerging around the Natufians. Now, around this time, we have some other societies starting to crop up. We have Ein Gazal around Anam, Jordan, and by 6000 BCE, this place covered 10 acres, just like 
Jericho, and here we find buried the heads of important people, but without their corpses, suggesting what we're not very sure, other than there are ever more complex and interesting and very mysterious burial rituals being passed down among early humans. Around this time as well, we get, and you'll have to excuse my pronunciation, Kathal Hayuk in Turkey, which would have been our largest city so far. This place would have been a place of about 5,000 people uh, living together in one place around an agricultural production model. Kathal Hayuk houses and burial practices indicate class division. Not everybody's house is that nice. Not everybody gets buried the same way. There are important people. There are rich people. There are unimportant people. There are poor people. There are haves. There are have-nots already in 6000 BCE. And it also has, very importantly, evidence of craft specialization. So it's not just that agriculture has allowed these people, some of them to get rich and others not, but it's allowed them, they're producing enough surplus that they can begin to look at other things to do with their time. We had our very, very early humans with enough free time to develop paints and things like that. With agriculture and the extra sur food surplus that creates, we have humans beginning to devote uh, some of them full time to things like pottery, rope making, tool making, that sort of thing. But with Katal Hayuk, we are done with the peopling of the world. There are now people everywhere, and they are, for the most part, at their own pace, but everybody getting there mostly independently, discovering how to cultivate crops, discovering how to domesticate animals. It is in the next module where we get something new once more, the emergence of the state, and that is both boring and incredibly exciting, so I will see you then.